All right, guys. In our last session, a battle charged with the electric pulse of magic and the clash of steel unfolded in a dance of strategy and raw power. With the ancient lighthouse in the heart of the Underdark serving as the stage for this confrontation, the air was thick with the scent of spells cast, steel drawn, and the indomitable spirit of those who refused to yield. In a twist of fate and cunning, Tronald orchestrated an ingenious maneuver. Employing a suggestion spell with unparalleled precision, he turned the tide of battle, bending the will of the malevolent Elder Rattlebone to his own. With a word, a mere whisper of power, he compelled her to cast Plain Shift, sending Lunaria, ensnared by dark packs and dire magic, back to the sanctuary of her home in the Fey Realm. Yet victory did not come without its shadows. Elder Rattlebone, her schemes thwarted, but her spirit unbroken, slipped through the fingers of justice, disappearing into the ether. Her escape, a lingering blemish upon the triumph of the day, will continue to serve as a reminder that evil, once rooted, is not always so easily vanquished. She remains at large, a specter of vengeance lurking in the darkness, ever hunting her prey which eluded her grasp. All in all, you achieved what many would deem impossible, not only did you rescue Tronald from the clutches of a fate most grim, but you also saved Lunaria from almost certain death. Through ingenious plays, unwavering bravery, and the strength of your bonds, you turned despair into hope, ensuring that light continues to shine in the darkness. So, what would you like to do? Hey, Alexandru, thank you. Seriously, I can't begin to explain how grateful I am. All of you, thank you. Don't worry about it, Tronald. Yeah, it hurt like a bitch. There's no denying that. But I speak for everyone when I say that everyone here would have done the same thing in a heartbeat. It just so happened that this time, I possessed the ability to see it through. I don't mean just for saving me directly, but for preserving something else, something far more vital to me, my honor, my word. I gave Celestia my word that we would bring her back to us. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that if Might hadn't been able to revivify me, you all would have chosen to use the Scroll of Resurrection on me instead of saving it for Celestia. So for that, I am profoundly, deeply grateful. Yeah, well, that's just the way it is with the type of lives we live. We never know what's going to happen next. But you've got to believe, if we had to use the Scroll on you, we would have found another way to bring Celestia back. There's always a way. Anyway, I can't believe that's it. That Lunaria has gone. Tronald, how did you do it? You know how I did it. You were there. I cast suggestion on Rattlebone, forcing her to send Lunaria home. No, I don't mean that. I mean, how... How did you forgive her? How did you push that anger you must have felt aside to risk your own life to prolong hers? Because if that was me, in the situation you were in, I don't know if I could have done it. Well, I certainly couldn't have done it. Hell, it didn't even happen to me, and I was ready to serve her up. Guys, there are two types of people in life. Those who let the darkness of their past define them, and those who choose to step into the light despite it. Lunaria, she made a mistake, but who among us hasn't? What would me resenting her have changed? It wouldn't have altered the end result. It wouldn't have brought me or anyone else peace. Might have brought me a little bit of peace, not gonna lie. Forgiveness isn't just about the other person. It's about freeing ourselves from the burden of hatred, of letting go so we can move forward. Holding on to anger, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. In risking my life for hers, I chose to uphold the values that make us who we are. Honor, compassion, unity. They're not just words, they're the very foundation of our bond. If we lose sight of that, if we let the darkness consume us, then we've already lost, regardless of the battles we win. I mean, all this time, I've seen you as this strategist, a wizard first and foremost, focused on the mission, on winning. I've always pegged you for the hold a grudge type, someone who'd put logic over emotion every single time. Being called a friend in my book, That's Sacred, it's not just a title, not just a word. It's a promise, a commitment, something not so easily broken. But don't mistake my willingness to forgive a friend as weakness, because if we're talking about my enemies or the general population, I'd rain hellfire down on them if they wronged me or mine. So 
I'm not this forgive and forget guy you're thinking of. Oh, well, whatever you are, you're a pretty cool guy and my book's Tronald. So what do you guys want to do then? Should we rest? I mean, there's no doubt about it. We need a long rest. But should we do that here? Or should we wait until we get out of the, well, get out of the underdark? Well, before we do that, should we see what we can loot atop the lighthouse? If this was Rattlebone's main place of residence, she might have some nifty gadgets up there. True, a little bit of looting never hurt anyone. Let's loot away then, guys. All right. Joe, we head to the top of the lighthouse and begin searching for anything of value. All right. You all ascend the winding staircase of the lighthouse. After a few tense minutes, you reach the summit. The scene that greets you is one of utter devastation. The aftermath of the machine exploding has left the area in shambles. Metal and arcane components are strewn about, some pieces still humming with residual energy, others smoldering quietly in the corners. The room bears the scars of battle. Frozen, shattered pieces of what once were furnishings dot the landscape, victims of the Cone of Cold. These icy fragments mingle with the dark, scorched marks blistered into the stone by Tronald's fireball spell. Amidst this chaos, a peculiar detail catches your eye in the center of the room, a small pile of infernal ashes still smoldering. These ashes, unlike the rest of the debris, emit a faint otherworldly glow. So, what the hell is that, Tronald? What the hell indeed. Honestly, I'm not too sure myself on that one. For some reason, Vizuriel thought it was a good idea to intervene during my little predicament. Not only did he give me a jump start, so to speak, which effectively broke the machine and my restraints, allowing me to fight back, but he also summoned some kind of bone devil to protect me. I'm not going to pretend I understand why he does what he does, because frankly, I don't have a clue. Vizuriel's motives are as mysterious as they are troubling, but whatever his reasons, that intervention, without a doubt, saved my life. I'm confused. Are we supposed to hate him for killing Celestia, or like him for saving Tronald? I don't think it's black and white, Rar. I think this is a perfect example of grey. I don't know why, but I could have sworn you were about to say green. Why would I say green? I don't know, why wouldn't you? Anyway, Joe, can we start having a look around, see what's not been destroyed? Roll me an investigation check, Saxy. That's a 16. With a roll of 16, your attention is drawn to an anomaly amidst the chaos. A lockbox, curiously untouched by the destruction surrounding it. Measuring approximately two feet in width and one foot in height, its surface is adorned with intricate markings that seem to dance and twist in the dim light, depicting scenes of torment and despair that unsettle the soul. The motifs carved into its dark metal are reminiscent of the hag's own twisted realm, featuring gnarled trees with screaming faces and creatures twisted in agony. Symbols of dark magic and necromancy are embossed around its edges, forming a border of sinister elegance. Most unnerving is the keyhole, crafted in the likeness of a withered hand, its palm upturned and waiting as though ready to clasp onto anything inserted into it. But it is the eye on the lid that truly captures the essence of dread that Elder Rattlebone was known for. This eye, fleshy and real, yet eerily unmoving, stares out into the room with an accusatory glare, as if it were silently witnessing the aftermath of its owner's departure. Well, that's fucking weird. What isn't weird in this place? Hey guys, what are the chances that there are some goodies in there, you reckon? Probably high, but I'd wager that it's going to be trapped for a start. Hey, Alexandru, fancy giving it a once-over? See if there are any traps? Yeah, so I'm all for that, but all of us, aside from Saxy, are pretty beat up. So if it is trapped, and I trigger said trap, and if it unleashes anything remotely as close to what we know Rattlebone could do, then we're going to be in a pretty rough spot. So you're saying that we should all get out of the room before you try it? Um. More that we should probably take a short rest before we fuck around with the hag's creepy lockbox. Oh, right, gotcha. I'm down for taking a short rest. But if something else rocks up whilst we're having the short rest, we're all dead. Look, we will all leave the room, Alexandru. Then you try to unlock it. If you fail, which I'm confident you won't, because I believe in you, then we have enough healing between us to bring you back. Wait, why is this falling to me? Aren't you more proficient in this kind of thing? Um, yeah, you're gonna be better with this, Saxy. Plus, I don't think you even took a scratch in that fight, so if something does happen, you're most likely to survive. But I've got healing spells, in case Alexandru falls. Don't worry, Mr. Saxy, I've got healing spells too. Wait, I don't even have any thieves' tools left. Does anyone else have any? Nope. Nah. None for me. Yeah, I've got two. We should really stock up on these next time we get the chance. Somebody add it to the shopping list. We'll hand them over here then, and get out of the room, all of you. God damn it. Joe, 
When they're all out of the room, I begin examining the lockbox for traps. Saxy, as you delve deeper, exploring every crevice and mechanism for hidden dangers, you find no evidence of traps. However, relief swiftly gives way to unease as the lockbox presents a disconcerting surprise. The eye, previously unremarkable and still, stirs to life under your scrutiny. It begins to move, tracking your movements with an unsettling awareness that seems impossible for such an inanimate object. As it watches you, its gaze alive and alert, a cold shiver runs down your spine. The sensation of being observed so closely by something so uncanny is deeply unsettling. Guys, you can come back in now. It's not trapped. She's watching us. What do you mean she's watching us? You see that eye? It's moving, watching. My bet is that it's linked to Rattlebone. Creepy old hag. Should we still proceed with this then, or what? Joe, I raise my greatsword into a thrust position and plunge it into the eye. Or we could do that. Rar, you raise your greatsword, and without a moment's hesitation, you thrust it downward, targeting the unnervingly sentient eye atop the lockbox. The moment your blade makes contact, the lockbox reacts as if it were a living entity. It reels and squirms under the force of your attack, a disturbing display of animation that seems almost impossible. A small burst of arcane energy erupts from the point of impact. As the energy dissipates, the the eye, once vigilant and unsettlingly alive, shuts abruptly. From its closed lid, black ooze begins to seep, trailing down the sides of the lockbox in a slow, viscous descent. The sight of it marks a peculiar end to the eerie vigilance that had pervaded the room. Ha! Take that! Well, seeing as that's out of the way, let's crack this open. Joe, I attempt to lockpick it. Roll it for me, buddy. That's a 15. Taking a deep breath to steady your focus, you insert your lockpick into the keyhole. As you work, the lockpick moves with precision. The clatter of tumblers falling into place is music to your ears, a symphony of progress. Metal hits metal in a dance as old as the craft itself. Then abruptly the noise ceases, an uneasy stillness falls, a harbinger of something amiss. With a cautious pull, you retrieve the lockpick, only to find a shocking sight. The tool has been corroded as if eaten away by a potent acid, leaving you holding nothing but a stub of what once was. Oh my god. So it seems like you have to pick it within a certain amount of time, or whatever defense mechanism is inside, there will dissolve the tool. I've just had a thought. If we're planning to long rest shortly, shall I just use another knock spell on it? Wow. Dude, if that was an option, why didn't you just do that from the start? Well, I didn't want to trigger a trap if one was there, did I? For all we know, fireballs could have shot out of it and we'd all be dead. But seeing as Saxy's made sure it's not trapped, I will happily cast the spell now. Is that what you're doing then, Might? Yeah, that's what I'm doing, Joe. All right. Concentrating deeply, you weave the spell, the arcane words falling from your lips like a key seeking a lock, long sealed. With a final utterance, the magic is released, targeting the lockbox with precision. The air vibrates with the spell's power. Then suddenly, the lockbox reacts. It swings open with a sound that is almost a gasp, its secrets now laid bare. Nice job, man. All right, wasting no time, I'll walk over and have a little gander inside. Tronald, you move forward to peer into the now open lockbox, the contents of which are illuminated by the faint, eerie light still lingering in the room. The first item to catch your eye is a tome. It's bound in dark, almost sinister-looking leather, worn at the edges as if caressed by countless hands through the years. Upon opening it, you find that it is filled with spells, the ink shimmering slightly. The margins are dense with notes, sketches, and arcane symbols, many of which are unfamiliar and tantalizingly beyond your current understanding. It's clear that this grimoire is a treasure trove of magical knowledge. Next, you find what appears to be a simple cloth bag, unremarkable and mundane. However, as you reach inside, your arm extends far deeper than the bag's dimensions should allow. The interior defies logic, seeming to stretch infinitely, a space unbound by the laws of physics. You're pretty confident that this is a bag of holding, considering that Saxy already possesses one and it seems to line up pretty accurately. The third item lies folded neatly at the bottom. It's a cloak, crafted from a fabric that seems to absorb light, giving it a depth like the night sky. The cloak's trim is adorned with subtle bat-like motifs, the stitching perfect and deliberate. Its clasp is shaped like a bat in mid-flight, its wings spread wide, a beautiful piece of craftsmanship. Lastly, you find a ring. This delicate band is made of a metal that gleams with an inner light, etched with intricate runes that pulse softly. Beautiful. Well, we probably shouldn't waste time identifying these now, but instead, try to find a way out of here. Then, when we know we're somewhere a bit safer, I'll identify them and we can have a long rest. Agreed. Joe, I want to head back down towards where the teleportation circle was. 
Does it still look inactive? Saxy, you descend the lighthouse's winding staircase and head outside towards the teleportation circle. Upon arrival, the runes, once dim and lifeless, now pulse with a vibrant energy, each symbol alight with arcane power. It's evident the circle is fully active again. It's now 100% clear that the previous inactivity was not a mere malfunction or decay over time, but a direct block from Elder Rattlebone herself. Her intentions were to trap you here, a strategic move designed to ensure no easy escape from the confrontation you so willingly walked into. Oh, brilliant. Guys, the circle is active again. Get yourselves down here and let's get the hell out of this place. Come on then, guys, let's head down. After you, buddy. God, I cannot wait to see sunlight again. As Saxy's call echoes up the lighthouse, urging haste, you all converge with a shared sense of urgency, descending to where the teleportation circle hums with newfound life. However, this fleeting moment of hope is quickly tempered by an all too familiar sound that sends a chill down your spine. The distant roars of minotaurs. Oh, hell no. Their guttural calls reverberating through the lighthouse's vast expanse herald an imminent threat. The sound of heavy hooves and snarled breaths grows louder, a menacing chorus that leaves little doubt. These are likely reinforcements summoned by Elder Rattlebone, a final gambit from a foe unwilling to concede defeat even in her absence. Oh no, Joe, I quickly dash towards the circle and begin trying to activate it. I spin around, pistol at the ready, aiming it towards where I hear the noises coming from, ready to fire shots the second I see anything. Roll an arcana check for me, Tronald. Nice, that's a natural 20, Joe. With no time to waste, Tronald and Saxy spring into action, their movements a flurry of precision and arcane knowledge. Tronald, his hands weaving through the air, begins to chant the complex incantations required to activate the circle. The symbols on the ground pulse in response, a dance of light and shadow that grows more intense with each word he utters. Hurry up, man, they're getting closer. I'm going as fast as I can. Saxy, meanwhile, stands guard, his eyes scanning the approaching darkness for any sign of the enemy. As the incantations reach their crescendo, the teleportation circle bursts into full radiance, a beacon of escape amidst the looming threat. Now, get your asses on this circle. I move onto the circle, Joe. I back up onto the circle with my pistol still aimed outward. Don't have to tell me twice. I move onto it. I proceed to reposition my ass onto the circle, Joe, as per instruction. You all dash into the center of the circle. Then suddenly, the world shifts around you, reality bending in ways that defy comprehension. The last thing you hear as you leave the lighthouse behind is the fading roar of minotaurs, a distant threat rendered impotent by your escape. How do we break this thing, Tronald? The last thing we want is them following us back up into this goddamn goblin camp. Well, we either need to use a dispel magic on it, or... Or what, dude? Quick! Or hit it. Hit it, really? Really? Hard. Joe, I begin slashing at the teleportation circle as viciously as I can. Make two attack rolls for me. Reckless, great weapon master. That's a natural 20 and a 24 total. Nice, let's see that damage. 30 for the first hit and 16 for the second. Rawr. As soon as you hear Tronald's words, you grip your great sword with a resolve as hard as the steel in your hands. Without a moment's hesitation, you raise the weapon high above your head. With a warrior's cry, you bring the greatsword down upon the teleportation circle. The first strike lands with a force that reverberates through the floor. Runes, once alight with magical energy, flicker and dim under the might of your blow. Undeterred, you swing again, completing the destruction of the circle's runic formation. The circle reacts as if wounded, sizzling and cracking, the once vibrant lines of power disintegrating before your eyes. As the last semblance of magic fades away, the circle becomes nothing more than a marred patch of stone, its viability for use now extinguished. Awesome work, Rar. Thank the gods we're out of there. That could have seriously got messy. You're damn right it could have. Let's head back up to Rattlebone's hut, then we can have a long rest. Okay, so you all make your way back up the cold metal ladder, back to the familiar surroundings of Elder Rattlebone's eerie hut. Great. All right then. Let's waste no time. Joe, I want to start identifying the items we found. Only the ring and the cloak, we know what the other two are after all. A bag of holding and the equivalent of a spell book. Tronald, as you begin to ritually cast Identify, the air around you hums with the anticipation of arcane revelation. You lay out the objects of your inquiry before you. First, your focus settles on the cloak. As the spell's energy surrounds it, the cloak seems to absorb the magic, responding with a subtle shimmer. The arcane knowledge flows into your mind, revealing the cloak's unique ability. This black garment, when worn, grants you the power to transform into a bat through the polymorph spell once per day. While in this form, you retain your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores. Next, you turn your attention to the ring. 
This is a ring of spell storing. The ring can store up to five levels worth of spells at a time, a reservoir of magical energy that you can tap into when the need arises. Well, goddamn, that's some epic loot. It goes without saying, I hope, that I'll be taking the ring. Who wants this nifty cloak? I really wouldn't mind having that. What are your reasons behind wanting it? And if you say it's because you want to add bat to your ever-growing list of animal names, I swear to God. No, of course not. Well, I mean, man, bear, elk, bat does sound pretty cool, but that's not my only reason. What's your other reason then? Oh, you know, so I can close distances. Yeah, exactly. Let's say a big baddie's atop a lighthouse. I'd have no way I could get to them, right? But what if I changed into a bat? I flew up there, flew about 200 feet above them, then came out of my bat form. I'd be flying down at the little shit just like them minotaurs did to us, dealing some hefty damage. Yeah, okay, you've got me on board. I like it. Here you go, Ra. I'm, I'm, I'm Batman. Oh my God. All men have limits. They learn what they are and then learn not to exceed them. I ignore mine. What are you talking about, dude? I'm Batman. Sweet, so we've got Batman and Catman. Speaking of Catman, can we have a rest yet? I need my beauty sleep. So are you all having a long rest? Yeah, now is the hour for sleep. Let's take it in turn standing watch just to make sure nobody makes an unwanted visit. If anyone asks what we're doing here, we will say that we're just helping Rattlebone with something. I doubt they'll push us for more details. So who's taking first watch? I'll take the first watch, Joe. Then I guess we could just go in order around the table. All right, you all begin to settle into the hut for a much needed long rest. The plan is simple. Rest in shifts, ensuring someone is always on the lookout, guarding against any unwelcome surprises that might decide to pay a visit in the night. For Might and Rar, you find that exhaustion quickly gives way to sleep. However, Saxi, you find rest to be quite elusive, your mind a whirlwind of thoughts about Lunaria, her safety and her future. Each toss and turn is a silent struggle against the tide of worry and what-ifs. As for you, Alexandru, you too are caught in the grip of concern, your thoughts trailing back to Master Shenzu. The weight of your mentor's situation, the ticking clock against his life, once again presses heavily upon you. Yet amidst the worry, a glimmer of intuition whispers that if the worst had come to pass, you would surely have felt it. You must have. Okay, Tronald, I'm gonna need you to make a perception check for me. That's a 14, Joe. About an hour into the watch, the stillness of the night is broken by the soft creak of the door. Tronald, alert and watchful, turns to see a familiar figure slip into the hut, Goba. Oh, boss, Tronald, by the twisty tunnels. It's a sight for sore eyes, it is. Seeing you alive and kicking, I didn't expect to find you tucked away in here. Been out there I was, circling the hut, keeping me eyes peeled for trouble, guarding against the sneaks and creeps. Oh. Hey, Gaba, how are you doing, buddy? Oh, and you don't need to whisper. I'm pretty sure they're all hard on asleep. Elder Rattlebone, then? She's pushing up daisies, is she? Got the better of her, you did? Well, Gaba, it's a bit of yes and no. Turns out our Elder Rattlebone wasn't just an old goblin. She's a hag, and an ancient one at that. And to be honest, I'd say she was the toughest scrap we've ever found ourselves in. But we managed to beat her down enough that she had no choice but to flee. We tried to stop her, gave it everything we had, but in the end, she slipped through our fingers. So, there's no doubt in my mind she'll be back at some point, aiming to finish what she started. Well, that ain't ideal, is it, boss? Anyway, you're back now, and that's what's important, right? How about you get some rest? Yeah? Gobble will keep watch while you guys sleep. Can't let you do that, buddy. You've been awake just as long as we have. You're gonna need some rest, too. After all, a growing wizard needs his sleep. You're good to me. You are, boss. But but let me at least take over from your watch. Promise I'll swap with Rar when I'm feeling too sleepy. You're a good gabo, Gaba. Thank you. Joe, I head over to a corner of the hut and begin my long rest. Tronald, as you settle into the corner of the hut, the weight of exhaustion pressing down on your eyelids, you find sleep overtaking you with surprising ease. It's an unnatural quickness, one that rivals the lucidity of even the night at the farm. Instead of descending into the realms of sleep, you almost feel as if you were asleep, and you're only now just waking up. You find yourself almost floating, standing yet suspended in the boundless expanse of the astral sea where stars and nebulas paint a canvas of unfathomable depth. 
The cosmic ballet around you, a whirl of colors, light and shadow, fades into the background as you find only a singular figure for company. It is Vizuriel. Cloaked in the cosmic winds that howl, silent songs of ancient secrets embodies a majesty that is both awe-inspiring and terrifying. The space around him, charged with the echoes of arcane forces, seems to thrum with anticipation, as if the universe itself is holding its breath in his presence. His silhouette, framed against the backdrop of astral splendor, radiates an authority that does not just command attention, it demands it. I suppose you're pondering the reasons behind my intervention. You find yourself adrift in questions, seeking answers where the threads of destiny intertwine where every choice begets a future unseen. Look around you, Tronald. Look how beautiful it is. Do you know that within this infinite expanse lies the Akashic Records, the ethereal compendium of all knowledge and histories? It is said that within its boundless depths, the tale of every soul, every civilization that has ever existed and will ever exist is inscribed hmm the impermanence and the eternal all at once yeah i want to know why you saved me that would be a good starting point after that you can tell me why you killed celestia your desire for clarity is understandable yet you must tread carefully on the path of knowledge the why of my actions particularly my intervention in your fate and that of celestia's is woven into a tapestry far more complex than the simple dichotomy of salvation and damnation. You really do like the sound of your own voice, don't you? Why did you kill Celestia? Consider the nature of assumptions, Tronald. They are the veils through which we view the world, often obscuring the truths that lie just beyond our grasp. Let me pose you a quandary. If I presented you with a glass of water, proclaiming it to be wine, would you believe me? And what if I offered you wine, affirming it was indeed wine? The crux of the matter lies not in the deception itself, but in persuading you to name it, to claim ownership of the assumption when, in fact, you stand upon the precipice of error. To manipulate belief is a straightforward affair. However, the inception of an idea, to make someone believe that the genesis of their understanding was of their own making, now, that is the art of true manipulation. It is the seed from which springs forth the most potent and enduring of illusions. Look, can we stop with this vocabulary foreplay for a minute? Tell me straight, are you trying to help me? And if you are, why do you want to bring Vecna and Orcus to the material plane? Your request for candor is noted, though simplicity in matters of cosmic consequence is often a luxury we can ill afford. Consider the process of forging steel, an analogy for the trials you face. To temper steel, to imbue it with the strength to withstand the ages, it must be subjected to the furnace's embrace time and again. It is through this relentless testing, this unyielding confrontation with heat and hammer, that true resilience is born. As for Orcus and Vecna, think of them not as ends in themselves, but as instruments in a grander orchestration. They are but tools, albeit dangerous ones, but nothing that I feel unable to wield. And they will be wielded in the pursuit of a higher goal. What higher goal? What could possibly be worth the death of millions of people? Not all individuals are created equally in the hearts of others, Tronald. Consider the depth of your affections the lengths to which you would go for those you truly value. How many lives would you exchange to bring your family back to you? And I'm not talking about Celestia. I'm referring to your real family, your sons, your wife. This is not a question of morality, but of attachment and the value we place on those attachments. But you asked what my goal was, and the answer to that, Tronald, is peace. A peace so profound and enduring that it justifies the turmoil required to forge it. A peace that, once established, will render all previous conflicts and sacrifices mere footnotes in the annals of history. And to achieve a goal as monumental as peace, 
sacrifices are often deemed necessary. The scale of these sacrifices may seem incomprehensible, yet they are weighed against the outcome they are meant to achieve. You've got to be kidding me. Thinking you can just puppeteer Vecna and Orcus? I'll admit it. You're formidable enough to give anyone pause, but this, this is beyond ridiculous. You've completely lost it if you believe you can bend not one, but two gods to your will. Who are you? And I mean, who are you really? Don't give me this, you can call me Vesuriel bullcrap. It appears your question delves deeper than mere curiosity of name or title. You seek to understand my essence, my place within this reality. Tronald, you're well versed with lineage about how that affects the power that courses through the veins. So I will ask you this. Are you familiar with the name Asmodeus? Well, you see, he is my progenitor. He is my grandfather. Tronald, suddenly you feel a force as if the very fabric of the dream itself rebels against the weight of that revelation. This invisible pull wrenches you from the astral expanse, tearing you away from the presence of Vesuriel and hurling you back into the tangible world. You sit up abruptly, a cold sweat drenching your skin, your heart pounding as if you've just run a marathon. You catch your breath, scanning the surroundings to find Rar silently pacing back and forth. His gaze is fixed outside the windows, scanning the night for signs of danger, seemingly unaware of your sudden awakening. Taking a moment to collect yourself, you feel the residual adrenaline slowly ebb away. You lay back down where gradually sleep claims you once more, drawing you back into its embrace. And I think that's where we will wrap up this session. See you later, guys.